And uh, you might be a bit surprised now suddenly to see work on uh, microbial management. What has this to do with uh, good health of fish and shrimp? Well, that's what I will try to uh, illustrate in this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, a presentation that is based on uh, a lot of work, uh, not only done at Ghent University in a number of labs, three different faculties, but uh, as you will hear and see also uh, at a number of other places in Europe and in uh, uh, Asia. Diseases is a big problem. I show some uh, figures here uh, for uh, shrimp diseases. And as you can uh, quickly overview there in the table, we are talking about millions, even up to billions of US dollars uh, that are lost through diseases. Uh, one of the most spectacular ones in recent years uh, was the early mortality syndrome. And as Benjamin was referring to, uh, later it was diagnosed as acute hepatopancreas uh, necrosis uh, disorder or disease caused by a uh, Vibrio Vibrio parahemolyticus. In the meantime, people have seen that uh, a number of other Vibrios uh, can uh, uh, result in uh, the same disease. So we could call it a vibriosis. Um, about 10 years ago, well, a little bit more than 10 years ago, uh, at the last global conference on aquaculture organized by FAO, by the way, the next one was scheduled for 2020, but will take place in September of this year in Shanghai. Aquaculture uh, priorities for the future were discussed at that meeting. And <clears throat> one of the points that was coming up is, of course, we need to focus and, and see how we can solve diseases and look into disease treatment and look for alternatives for antibiotics, uh, for example, but that we need to pay really more attention to disease prevention. Um, a disease prevention, which should be more based on uh, knowledge gathering. And I think we have seen a very good example in the previous presentation where uh, Benjamin was uh, uh, showing with the new tools that are available that we can better explain uh, uh, effects, that we can better explain uh, uh, how certain systems, like for example, uh, the limited knowledge that was available and that is being extended now when it comes to the immunology of invertebrates. And that's where uh, the shrimp uh, belong to as well. A lot, as we have seen, a lot is maybe known for vertebrates, including fish. But in the case of uh, crustaceans, a lot was based on an empirical approach. And that's where, with the new tools that are available, that we need to look into uh, innovation and innovation. Well, uh, you see uh, uh, of the list that was identified at that conference, uh, more knowledge on immune systems. So this is what was just covered by Benjamin. Uh, I will uh, look uh, uh, in this presentation to the progress that has been made on uh, better knowledge of the role of the bacteria and how eventually we can come up with better microbial management. And in fact, it is in uh, uh, the last uh, few years, uh, this was a conference here in uh, Belgium in 2017, where uh, a number of presentations uh, were focusing on microbiology and the role of the microbes. And how does it come that uh, all by a sudden we can uh, do more research on uh, the role of the bacteria. Well, it has a lot to do with the tools that have become available. In the past, we were all, and still today for routine analysis, uh, we are relying on plating techniques, the, the classic TCBS, Marina, Guard, uh, you name it. But, but microbiologists, the bacteriologists uh, can tell us that it is less than 5% of the uh, existing bacteria that you can recover, that you can, in fact, uh, identify in your aquatic system. Now that we have access to um, sequencing, uh, DNA fingerprinting, um, we can uh, um, look into uh, the real diversity of uh, bacteria in uh, the systems. 
And this is where uh, many, many studies in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America have revealed that we are dealing with a tremendous diversity. Each uh, uh, aquatic system uh, is holding thousands of different uh, species that are then grouped in different clusters, as you can see, for example, represented here in this graph. I will come back to that later. Next, there is also new knowledge on uh, the functioning of these bacteria. And where in the past we all learned how primitive these bacteria are, I must say the new knowledge that is generated and uh, it evolves year after year, uh, new findings about how sophisticated these bacteria are. And for example, there is this bacterial communication through uh, um, signal molecules that are excreted by the bacteria. And this is a phenomenon that is uh, uh, known under the name quorum sensing. So testing, sensing the quorum, the density, the numbers. So uh, through the exchange of these uh, signal molecules, the bacteria will realize at a certain moment, oh, we are in sufficient numbers. Okay, I know some of you will ask, please tell us what is that critical number? This is where I will explain also later that this is still uh, a lot of uh, uh, questions, a lot of uh, uh, further studies that need to reveal what are these critical densities to reach quorum. And when quorum is reached, then only then these bacteria, these opportunistic bacteria will switch on the virulence genes at that, and that can be the uh, excretion of uh, toxins, that can be biofilm formation, uh, anything that uh, results in uh, a status of pathogenicity. So very important new knowledge about the functioning and uh, the role that uh, the bacteria may play in function of the densities at which they occur in uh, our pond system or in our uh, tank system. So with uh, the knowledge we have today, uh, be it a fish pond, a shrimp tank, uh, we, have, we are dealing with a random mixed microbial community. And I'm using uh, uh, these symbols here to just show you that we are dealing with a big diversity, which for simplification, we could classify in three groups. The group we know least about, this is uh, the beneficial bacteria. When I talk about beneficial bacteria, some of you will immediately think about the nitrifiers. Indeed, they play a very important role in, in uh, converting uh, uh, organic matter into uh, um, the uh, inorganic uh, matter, making it available then again for photosynthesis. But there is much more. We know that there are bacteria that are secreting uh, uh, proteases, uh, lipases, uh, a number of bioactive compounds, uh, 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 some of which uh, we also heard about in uh, the presentation of Benjamin. Of course, in aquaculture, we are mainly concerned and uh, most of the attention in the past has gone to the pathogens. Uh, of course, in the first place, the obligate pathogens. But a group we were not so well aware of and we didn't pay enough attention to, it had to do with the fact that we didn't uh, have the right tools to study them, was these potentially harmful bacteria, the opportunists, the ones that, uh, as I explained in the previous slide, react on uh, quorum sensing. So, in aquaculture, we don't want to see any of these pathogens, be it an opportunistic one or an obligate one. We want to get them out of our system. And how can we accomplish that? Well, this is the classic disinfection technique that we are applying. Biosecurity, first of the recommendations in any manual on biosecurity is do a proper disinfection. And do a proper disinfection when, when you will follow now the animation here in the tank. Well, of course, we will kill all the bacteria. We will kill the pathogens, but the good ones are also gone. 
And we all know that, okay, once you have done a disinfection, uh, you, of course, you have to make sure that the chlorine or the ozone or whatever, whatever other disinfectant that you have used, that it is removed from the system, that you start with the so-called sterile system. But you know that within minutes, in fact, we will get a new bacterial colonization. We will see, and I will explain in the coming slides, what the difference is between, and these are ecological terms, the R strategists and the K strategists. But within minutes, we will see that the water becomes again contaminated with bacteria. Hopefully not with the uh, uh, obligate uh, pathogens because we try to work in conditions where we keep uh, these uh, organisms out, but there are the opportunistic uh, uh, pathogens, the vibrios. So what is now that uh, difference between the R and the K strategists? And I repeat, most of the vibrios or belonging to these R strategist uh, bacteria. We look into enrichment, and what do I mean with enrichment? Well, when we have, when we are stocking our pond, when we are introducing our fish larvae in the hatchery tank, we are not only introducing the animals, but we are also introducing food, feed. And that, of course, is food for the animals, but at the same time, we know there is leaching. In the case of shrimp, there is a certain retention time of the feed in the pond. And of course, this is a good substrate for the bacteria. And rapid growth, as soon as there is enrichment, is the typical characteristic of the R strategist bacteria. Very important to realize is that once there is not much substrate available anymore, we will see how that might be realized in our system. When there is limited substrate per individual, then these R strategist bacteria are not doing so well. This is the big difference with the K strategists who have a slow growth, but who are very specialized when it comes to low substrate per individual. So that means that maybe in the beginning, when uh, we are uh, starting in an environment where all the niches are open, because we have made them open through that disinfection, wow, the R strategist will have a good chance to bloom and to develop. And we will see that our K strategist bacteria, well, they will develop, but at a much slower rate, as we will see in uh, the next slides. So, Let's try to visualize now what happens in reality uh, at the bacterial level in the pond or in the tank where we are putting in our animals. You follow the animation, you see that indeed the R strategists are the ones that will dominate very fast. Uh, why? Well, because there is a very high amount of substrate available per bacterium. And there are a lot of niches available in uh, the aquatic system. Provided we leave enough time, we will see that eventually the um, substrate will be reduced. The number of niches will be filled up with the uh, uh, A strategists. And you see that, okay, they are still there, the opportunistic. Uh, vibrios, but in small numbers. In the beginning, and, and that's where we had that typical phenomenon uh, in uh, shrimp uh, disease problems called early mortality syndrome. It was always within the first weeks of stocking that the problems happened. And that was in fact, because with the dominance of the uh, uh, opportunistic are strategists, Vibrios, the Vibrio parahemolyticus. Critical thing is, do they reach quorum? Bang! They will uh, uh, switch on virulence and you have a disease problem. If you can keep them, if that peak is below that critical level, well, then uh, you, can, uh, you can have a, um, a good production result. 
So very, very typical uh, in, uh, in a lot of our aquaculture systems is that after disinfection, and if we don't give enough time to have a proper balance between the K and the R strategists, we take a risk. And that risk can be very critical uh, when you are reaching uh, that particular uh, quorum sensing density and a dominance of uh, the uh, uh, vibrios. So later on, it became clear that uh, what started in uh, 2009 in China, that EMS later then called the acute hepatopancreas necrosis disease caused by Vibrio parahemolyticus. But I repeat, in the meantime, uh, these uh, um, vectors of uh, um, uh, peer A and peer B toxin genes uh, have already uh, been found in Vibrio Cambelli, in Vibrio uh, Harvey. So uh, uh, it is a typical vibriosis uh, problem. And um, initially, uh, and I'm referring to 2013, 2014, um, when uh, the big discussion was initiated on what can now be the cause of that EMS, is it a new virus? Is it a new bacteria? Is it a, is it a, a parasite? Um, we came up with uh, the knowledge uh, from uh, our groups in Ghent that maybe, and at that time it was a hypothesis, maybe it could be related to microbial management uh, uh, caused by uh, that um, imbalance between the R and K uh, strategists after disinfection. And our hypothesis was further, um, in fact, uh, um, uh, confirmed by work that was done in marine fish in uh, Norway. Uh, so uh, 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 a lot of work by the group of uh, Professor Olaf Vachtin in uh, uh, Trondheim University has in fact further uh, documented uh, much more in detail than the work that has that was known at that time in shrimp. Uh, between the K and the R uh, strategists. And that explains now also a lot of the problems uh, that um, we experience in marine fish aquaculture. And I show a slide here uh, for, uh, uh, it was presented at the conference just a year ago, uh, the European sea bass and sea bream industry. Um, uh, some of you might know that this is a very important uh, one billion fry production per year. So this is a very significant industry uh, that is uh, maybe slowly improving in terms of hatchery survival, but even with a hatchery survival of 30%, where you might say, okay, I can predict uh, that I will have that number. Well, the big problem is that you have a huge standard deviation that some runs you have 60, 70% survival. But in the next run, what happens? You uh, have a very low survival, or in many cases, after three or four days in the hatchery, they can open the tap and drain the animals, finish. Initially, it was a hypothesis that maybe some bacterial uh, interferences could be the case because people were able to prove of course, unsustainable practice, and then later on ab absolutely forbidden for a number of environmental and human reasons that when they were applying antibiotics, that they could improve the survival. So uh, with the KR strategy uh, 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 theory that we are aware of now, unpredictable performance has a lot to do with the uncontrolled microbial community caused by, on one hand, uh, suboptimal conditions where you might create conditions where uh, you favor these opportunistic bacteria, particularly after you have done a disinfection, and what we had underestimated, also the fact that using the live food, the algae, the rotifers, and the artemia, we were, all of us, we were thinking about nutrition, but we didn't realize that for example, algae grown in outdoor systems uh, when they are beyond uh, the peak of exponential growth. Uh, you have dying algae that is a good substrate for bacteria and 
Who are the first to benefit from? Of course, the opportunistic bacteria, the Vibrios. Same with rotifers, same with artemia. We need to uh, look into more biosecure production of live food, as I will also explain a little bit later. So the practice in hatchery tanks of uh, uh, regular water exchange and where people thought, okay, maybe that might be a way that we can control the system. Well, with the knowledge that we have today, we realize that this is not a good practice because water exchange will result in a washout of the bacteria. And you might say, yes, but that is exactly what we want to do. We want to uh, remove, we want to uh, wash out uh, these vibrios. Yeah, but at the same time, you are washing out also the good bacteria and the good bacteria require more time to colonize. So here you see, contrary to the slides that I showed you earlier, we can maybe reduce the level of the vibrios, but we might still take the risk that a quorum uh, might be reached or that other phenomena, as I do not have the time to explain unless it comes up in the Q&A session, uh, phenotype switching is a new discovery in uh, uh, Vibrio uh, behavior and switching on, switching off uh, virulence. So what is the best way to control the opportunistic bacteria in hatchery tanks? Application of a biofilter. Because in a biofilter, you just create all conditions to favor the K strategists and let them dominate over the uh, R uh, strategists. Okay, some of you might say this is all very nice and well for application in hatchery, but um, we also want to see how can this be applied in outdoor systems, in pond systems. And in fact, I will show you in the next slides that rather than to have to use a RAS system, we can also think about integrated uh, farming systems. But let me first come uh, to a first conclusion. Recommendation by the EU, as you will see at the end, now also taken up by FAO. There are a lot of good guidelines on the GAPs, good aquaculture practices, but we have to realize that time by time, we need to do a revision. Time by time, we need to learn about the new knowledge and maybe adjust the recommendations uh, that you see here and extend them with uh, extra efforts that are needed in biosecurity. And these extra measures in biosecurity are mainly dealing with microbial conditions where uh, our Norwegians, Norwegian friends are talking about mature water, uh, uh, in Asia, we are talking about uh, the green water, but where there is a role for the uh, uh, probiotics, for the bioflux, uh, for uh, a biofilter. I referred already to live food with the algae, the rotifers and the artemia, particularly in the hatcheries. And then throughout the production cycle, it's not just the seed material that you are using that should be special pathogen free. We need to see throughout the production cycle, how can we keep these pathogens under control? And uh, this means not only the uh, obligate pathogens, but also the opportunistic ones, the vibrios. And how can that be done in pond systems? It's very good that there is already first application and uh, I must say, I see it expanding very quickly in Asian countries and hope to hear the same maybe in the Q&A session uh, some comments from uh, uh, you participants from Latin American countries, but where in the past it was all pond area used for intensive shrimp uh, production, 50, 100, 150 per square meter, applying the uh, 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 rotation uh, aerators, but now zero exchange systems are applied that means that uh, water is recirculated over what is called a shrimp toilet, but then uh, in most of the situations, it's either with some seaweed, seaweed and tilapia, or uh, only tilapia. So uh, brackish water, uh, uh, of course, tolerant uh, uh, tilapia, 
uh, in the case of Thailand, uh, they are very successful with the uh, integration with uh, uh, Colerpa uh, uh, seaweed, which in the meantime even has become an extra crop, an extra added value in the shrimp farms. And very important uh, to see here that the Vibrio parahemolyticus is still present in the system. Even the Vibrio parahemolyticus carrying the genes for the peer A and the peer B toxin. But this Vibrio under these conditions uh, is not expressing virulence. It could be related to quorum sensing. It could be phenotype switching. It was interesting to hear from Benjamin that incorporation of uh, seaweed in some of the shrimp feeds resulted in a better resistance against a uh, challenge test with Vibrio parahemolyticus. This could be a phenomenon uh, which is now known as uh, phenotype uh, switching. Very interesting uh, uh, table here from uh, the CP company in uh, Thailand. The conditions in 2010, so that was before uh, the EMS uh, problem, before the farms started to do uh, routine disinfection. And uh, what is accomplished now, uh, let's look at the figures here for 2016. Um, they apply that so-called zero exchange system. So that means that only half of the area that was used before is now used for intensive shrimp, but half of the area is used in that recirculation, in that kind of integrated farming system. Where you had the big drop uh, in survival when EMS broke out, see that we are back to good figures in terms of survival, and of course that this results in a better profit. Initially, not easy to explain. I remember meetings and discussions in Vietnam and a number of other countries telling the farmers you should you should use only half of your area for shrimp and the rest for recirculation. And I remember some of the farmers telling, yeah, <laughs> this is again a scientist. And you think that with that I can convince uh, our managers that on a half the area, we will uh, be able to make a profitable production. Look at these figures here. This means that you have a predictable production because you can work under uh, more stable uh, conditions. So it means also that a lot of the empirical observations from the past, and I remember um, uh, first uh, problems that occurred with the vibriosis, and uh, some of you uh, uh, um, attending here will recall bioluminescence, Zoea 2 syndrome, bolitas, all kinds of uh, vibriosis problems that we didn't very well know how it comes because when we were using the diagnostics and we could see that Vibrio Harvey was present, but sometimes there was bioluminescence and then other occasions, although uh, our uh, uh, testing material indicated that the Vibrio Harvey was there, no bioluminescence. So this is where uh, very interesting to uh, uh, see the trial and error experience of farmers where they were smelling the water. And I still remember when the, the farmers in Taiwan were, were telling me, we can smell. This is a good pond water to do stocking of the shrimp. This other one has not the proper smell. It all had to do with that community, that ecology of probably uh, uh, the algae, but also the bacteria. So green water systems, tilapia aquaculture, very popular, for example, in uh, uh, the Philippines and now taken over uh, by a number of other countries. In the Philippines, it was mainly seen as a preventive measure against white spot. I will uh, uh, in a moment show you the slide of the synergetic uh, uh, co-infections. Well, today we know that the tilapia aquaculture is mainly to keep the vibrios under control. And when you can keep the vibrios under control, the risks for uh, the WSSV uh, uh, diseases is uh, decreasing. Probiotics can be used, uh, recirculation systems, as I have just shown in the previous slides. So these are uh, uh, two papers here 
uh, where uh, we see that we need to pay more attention to these synergistic effects of co-infections and where probably we have underestimated in doing that work in the past, the role of the Vibrio in uh, these uh, co-infections. And that confirms very well with the findings, for example, in the Philippines with uh, the uh, uh, co-culture with uh, Irapia. So that brings me to the end. Take home message is uh, already also uh, taken over by FAO recommending that we need in aquaculture, be it at the hatchery level, be it in the nursery, the maturation or the grow out, we need to develop and adapt better microbial management protocols. Protocols to not eliminate the disinfection. This remains an important, an important uh, uh, step in uh, uh, good biosecurity, but we need to see what kind of stabilization, what kind of mature microbial system we can induce. And this is where probiotics and already being used, but we need to better understand, we need to do a, a more a study on uh, uh, what the exact role and what the exact composition is of these good uh, bacteria. And this is where uh, we are uh, uh, expecting FAO also to pay more attention in, reco in recommending uh, future uh, research on microbiome uh, as uh, an important uh, knowledge gathering to learn about better microbial management approaches. Thank you very much. And uh, if you want further information, you can go to the website of the uh, UGENT Aquaculture R&D Consortium, a consortium of several labs specialized in different disciplines, different uh, faculties, but all zooming in on these problems in uh, aquaculture. Thank you very much.